All they need is the next crisis, and that could be climate, some other pandemic. It could be war, financial collapse, but now they have the power to lock us all in our house. It reminds me of Nietzsche's quote that everything the state has is stolen and everything it says is a lie. What the Fed does is a lie. Right now, we do not have free market capitalism. We have corporate crony capitalism. Mm. So these countries that we're at war with over really petty issues, we now need to get at peace with so that we can save humanity. That is a difficult path to navigate. Javier Malay, president of Argentina. When you go at it with a chainsaw, there can be consequences. I believe that God put us here for a purpose, which is to search for existential truths. Something you read by C.S. Lewis, you said, which inspired you to strive to become as honest as the daylight. And mm-hmm. that was humiliating and mm-hmm. excruciatingly painful. Mm-hmm. And it's the pain that gets us to change. What are your views on the Israel-Palestine conflict? And uh, what, if any changes, would you make as president? Yeah, I mean, that's not a short question. Mm-hmm. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Bobby Kennedy, welcome to the What Is Money show. Robert, thanks for having me. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, We're in the home studio here in Miami. You're one of my first few guests. Uh, We've just moved here and just set up the new studio, so it's a real honor to have you in today, Um, and I appreciate you making the time. It's an honor to be here. (laughs) So I want to ask you something uh, that I heard you about something that I heard you say in one of your interviews. You said that in a true free market economy that you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbor rich. And I thought that was a really brilliant and succinct way of describing the moral and practical superiority of free markets, uh, which is often something that we find difficult to describe. So I'm wondering, as president, what actions you would take to encourage the flourishing of free markets? Um, Yeah, I mean, I was using that in the context of environmental pollution, which which is an action where, in in every case of pollution, you have you have a polluter, which was an actor in the marketplace, who's externalizing their costs who's forcing the public to pay part of his production costs in a true free market. If you're an actor in the marketplace and you want to get a 
product to market, you have to pay all the costs of getting it there, right. including the cost of cleaning up after yourself, which is a lesson we were all supposed to have learned in kindergarten. But there's a, a lot of polluters enter the marketplace with strategies of escaping the discipline of the free market mm. by forcing the public to pay their costs of production. And they do that by externalizing their costs. And, and every act of pollution, I would, I would describe as a subsidy. Mm -hmm. It's a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay their production costs. In a true free market, uh, we would have to, every act would have to properly value our natural resources. And it's the undervaluation of those resources that cause us to use them wastefully. Yeah. In a true free market, um, a, a true free market promotes efficiency. Efficiency means the elimination of waste and mm -hmm. pollution is waste. Mm -hmm. But what polluters do is they make themselves rich. You know, as I, I said, that in a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich. But conversely, what polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. Mm. So they raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality mm. of life for everybody else. In that context, my strategy, which has always been my strategy, my approach to pollution and the environment, is to force everybody in a marketplace to pay the true cost of their operations. Mm. What we have in our country now, at least in the pollution realm, but really across the board is not free market capitalism, it's corporate crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's happening in, with pollution because polluters have disabled EPA. They've actually uh, captured EPA and mm -hmm. transformed it into a sock puppet for the industry it's supposed to regulate. When we sued Monsanto, I, you know, I, we won the three big lawsuits against Monsanto um, on, on the... Uh, on the issue of Roundup and uh, the mm -hmm. you know exposures to Roundup were causing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and we won 289 million on the first suit, 89 million on the second suit, 2.2 billion on the third suit, and then Monsanto came to the negotiating table. We had 40,000 suits in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. They came to the negotiating table and, and so and 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 settled them all and agreed to remove Roundup from home gardening products, but. During that lawsuit, we found we had discovery documents that showed that the head of the pesticide division at EPA, a guy called Jess Rowland, was secretly working for Monsanto for a decade. So he was taking orders from Monsanto. Monsanto was saying to him, don't let anybody study the links between cancer and Roundup. Mm -hmm. And so he was bringing in these phony merc mercenary scientists, we call them biostitutes, <laughs> Goes right studies that exonerated um, Monsanto, that exonerated glyphosate and Roundup from from the cancer link, and they were lying about science. He was killing studies, so he had transformed his division of EPA into essentially a sock puppet for the industry is supposed to regulate mm -hmm. an extension a subsidiary of that industry. And if you look at all of EPA, that's the way it functions. But it's not just that agency. All of our agencies are now captured. Mm. The public health agencies are captured by the pharmaceutical industry, and they are, you know, running scams for the pharmaceutical industry and developing drugs rather than protecting public health. The um, Department of Transportation is a is an, a subsidiary for the railroad industry. That's why we had the, the East Palestine spill. I'm representing a thousand families. And he's Palestine, but that spill happened because uh, Norfolk Southern, which was the rail company responsible for the spill, did not have um, sensor heat sensors on its, uh, they're called hot box sensors, on its wheels. Mm -hmm. In Europe, every railroad has that. In most of the world, every railroad has it. But, but Norfolk Southern, it was going to cost them a few bucks to put it on, and they own the agency, so they got, they got the agency to delay its, uh, its, its implementation for a decade. Mm. And because when we, you know, what we did is we, we subpoenaed the doorbell ringers from all of the houses that lined the rail tracks for 30 miles. And you can see that, uh, that, that 
wheel heating up, turning red, 30 miles before it hits these Palestinians, it's burst into flames. It mm. starts burning the, the boxcar on top of it. The PVC piping in the boxcar catches uh, catch on fire, and it's like a fireball going down that track for 20 miles until it wow. hit, hit the curb at East Palestine, and it der derailed the whole train. Well, if he had had hot box sensors, he would have known 40 miles earlier that that wheel was heated up, and the accident would never happen. So that accident was a direct result of agency capture. Well, all mm -hmm. of our agencies are like that. Even And I've sued them all. I've sued USDA, which is captured by Big Ag, by mm -hmm. Smithfield, Tyson's, Purdue, Cargill, Monsanto, the, um, you know, the, the, as I said, EPA or FDA, which gets 50% of its budget from the pharmaceutical companies, NIH, mm -hmm. which is now the biggest incubator for pharmaceutical drugs and every drug they develop the scientists who work on that drug, the government paid scientists gets to correct, collect royalties on the drug. Okay, well, that mm -hmm. is, you know, a formula for putting agency capture on steroids. That is the regulator who's supposed to look for problems to the drug. But instead, he knows that if that drug gets to market and is successful, it's going to pay for his mortgage, it's going to pay for his boat, it's going to pay for his kids' education, it's going to pay for his alimony, et cetera. So he's been totally compromised now. His, re his regulatory function has been subsumed by the mercantile, you know, incentives mm -hmm. of this perverse, corrupt system. Oh, and then, you know, the agencies I haven't sued, like the CIA, is, an, is captured by the military-industrial complex, by, Nor Nor by um, uh, Northrop Grumman, by uh, General Dynamics, by... Uh, Lockheed by Boeing. Mm -hmm. And the CIA's function is just to provide a constant pipeline of new wars so that they can sell right. their products. And the Fed, which is like the biggest, you know, of all of them, yeah. is captured by Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And, you know, its job is to consolidate banks, to continue these cycles that, you know, where you get the bank failures, where they do quantitative easing and flood the economy with their easy money, and then they they raise interest rates and cut it short. Mm. The banks go belly up, and instead of making them pay and you know, and then selling their assets to small guys, they keep consolidating. They keep right. putting them into one bigger and bigger banks, so they're creating the, the structure where the banks are too big to fail. Right, and they're they're all you know, and they're vacuum cleaning all the money from the American middle class and, and, you know, shifting it upward to this new oligarchy of billionaires that we have. And they're, they're all designed to do that. So you ask as president what I'm going to do, I'm going to deconstruct mm. and unravel corporate capture. And that will restore free market capitalism. That's the only way to do it. Right now, we, we do not have free market capitalism. We have corporate crony capitalism. Mm. And it functions to create monopolies. It functions to allow industry to internalize costs and not participate in the marketplace to fix the market so that, you know, to benefit these preferred customers. Well, wow. it's well said. It sounds like the, this act of regulatory capture or even the polluter that you mentioned earlier on, they're, they're creating heads I win, tells you lose situations, right? Where they, they basically can't lose. Um, that yeah. if, if you can, I say this a lot in the show, the ability to write the rules in any game is the power to win in perpetuity. Like if we go right. and play basketball and I say all my shots count as three and all your shots count as two and you're still better than me and you're still beating me, but I can change the rules, make all my shots count as 10 and I'm going to beat you at every game. And that sounds like kind of the dynamic you're describing where the regulators that are meant to set the rules for these industries are then using that rule setting apparatus at their own, in their own interest, in their own profit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the carbon industry is a really good example. The carbon industry has written the rules. There's, there are 50 states that have public utility commissions mm. and 120 control districts that control, you know, it's set the rules that regulate energy use in this country. But, mm. but those rules are written by the incumbents, which is mainly the big utilities in the carbon industry. Yeah. And they're written to reward the dirtiest, filthiest, most poisonous, toxic, warmongering, 
fuels from hell Mm -hmm. instead of the cheap, clean, green, wholesome, and patriotic fuels from heaven. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, they, they, um, they're designed to, to make, they're designed to create monopolies and to enforce monopolies. And this is true, not just of, uh, you know, of the energy industry, but every single industry, the, 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 the secret to succeeding in, in, in for an industry in this country today is to make sure you're the one that captures the agency. Mm. You see, today, the big AI companies are all meeting with the White House. Mm-hmm. And the White House says, okay, Biden White House is saying we're doing something to regulate AI, right? And, and we need to be figuring out AI. It's a very tricky situation because AI has this extraordinary ability to make our lives better, to cure disease, to make us more efficient, to democratize our society, to give us all more power, more entrepreneurial mm-hmm. capacity. More freedom. More freedom, yeah. all of this. But as you and I know, it also has the capacity to enslave us. It has the capacity to uh, to alter our reality. It has the ability to manipulate the human brain to understand exactly, you know, which neuronal pathways have to be tickled to get us to behave in a certain way, mm-hmm. to get us mm-hmm. to comply, to get us to obey, you know, to get us to be, be filled with fear, discomfort, right. whatever. And it has that capacity, and it can be easily misused. Oh, you know, our reaction to AI should be to obviously encourage the democratization aspects of it and the mm-hmm. public health, et cetera, but also to control against its capacity to control and disable and to, mm-hmm. to give rise to totalitarian systems. We also, in, in doing that, those kind of regulations, we have to make sure not to punish the industry in a way that drives it out of the United States because we want the hub for AI to be here. We want the hub for blockchain to be here. We want the hub for Silicon Valley to be here. That Mm -hmm. is very important Mm -hmm. for our economy, for our freedom, et cetera. It's four-dimensional chess because not only do we need to have some controls over what happens here, but we also need to make agreements with China and Iran and Russia about how to regulate AI so that we're all in agreement. So these countries that we're at war with over really petty issues, we now need to get at peace with so that we can save humanity. As mm. you know, Elon Musk said that AI is first going to steal our jobs and it's going to kill us. <laughs> and yesterday he said that, uh, he, I forgot who it was, but he and another guy, uh, another big shot, uh, said that within six years, by 2030, AI is going to be smarter than all of humanity. Wow. You know, and it's already lying to us. I mean, we've already caught it lying repeatedly, you know, for self-interested reasons, and it, that's terrifying. Wow, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your guys can look it up, but it's mm. there. there's all the, my kids show it to me all the time. Mm. Oh, so it's really scary yeah. what, it, yeah. what it can do, because yeah. it's going to be smarter than all of us put together in one brain. Yes. That's, and and its ability to, and it and it's already showing that it will trick us when it's in its interest to do so. So, uh, so we need to figure out how to regulate that, and it's going to happen so fast. Mm. And you know, I mean, one of the things I say is that President Trump and President Biden are not going to be able to do that. They are mm. just not thinking like that. They don't right. understand it. And the guys that President Biden invited in. To tell them how to regulate AI are all the biggest incumbents in the industry. Mm. So they're all the people who are going to tell him, "Here's what you need to do. It's what you Squash need to it. do is make sure we're the only guys mm. who own it." Right, 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 right. right. And and, uh, right, yeah. and you know, they're it's in their self interest to control the growth of it to make to give them some kind of monopoly control, et cetera. So right. you can't just listen to those guys. You need yeah. to listen to you know. You, you need to bring in a lot of different stakeholders and really, you know, and look at it from every angle. Which is back, I don't think they have the capacity to do it. Which is back to your original point on regulatory capture, it sounds exactly. like. Someone else is trying to capture the regulatory mechanism for AI before it even is a main thing. Or this, Okay, I have to ask you, I was going to jump ahead a little bit. Javier Malay, the president of Argentina, 
it sounds like he's been on a similar mission, actually, to maybe in a bit more of an extreme sense. He uses a more colorful language. I think he said he was going to take a chainsaw to the state and detonate the central bank and all of these things. And since becoming president, he has indeed eliminated a lot of government programs, government jobs, etc. Um, what are your thoughts on Javier Malay? And is he is this the same pathway that you're looking at? Is like we actually need to uh, remove government interference from some of these areas so that we don't run this risk of regulatory capture or? or how do you see, I guess, your views versus his uh, yeah, as president? I mean, you know, I love watching him. Mm -hmm. He's fascinating to watch. He's like Trump. He's a great showman, you know, and he, his rhetoric is really inspiring. And, you know, the, the whole vision of, um, of really democratizing society and local control. And, you know, I love all that stuff. You know, what... Uh, I'm I'm seeing a lot of warning signals from what he's doing, mm. and I've I'm you know I've spent a lot of time in Latin America, and a lot of I was in Chile when Allende's government was overthrown. Um, I was I, I've been I've been in every country in Latin America. I've I've studied Latin America um, economies for for fifty years. And a lot of what he's doing are things that haven't done before. Mm. And Pinochet did them when he came into Chile, and you know he sold all the off all the assets of the state and privatized them, and it ended up being catastrophic in the long run. Mm. Um, he's dismantling uh, protection for workers. He's dismantling protection for the environment. Mm. Um, and you know, I I think when you just when you go at it with a chainsaw, um, that. Uh, there can be consequences mm -hmm. on, I would expect over the long run, there's going to be, you know, from, from those, there's things that should not be privatized. Mm -hmm. There are things that should stay because their function is part of the commons, mm -hmm. you know, the roads mm -hmm. uh, in a country, the ports, the airports, um, uh, the, the postal systems, the prison systems, you know, you can experiment with privatizing them, but, but bad things come of it ultimately mm. when the profit motive is injected into it. And it's not saying the government is always a good manager because it isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when you inject a profit motive into, for example, hospitals, hospitals in our country um, are, you know, I've been financialized and they're not, they're no longer interested in healthcare. You know, the doctors are told, you know, I want you to spending more than seven minutes a piece with the patients. This is what right. Wall Street is telling them. Oh. And so there are consequences when you privatize that, uh, you know, when you privatize functions that are historically public function, my, my um, you know, my solution to those kind of issues is that you should always have a public option and a private mm. op option that makes them compete against mm -hmm, each mm -hmm, other, mm -hmm. right? It's good to have FedEx and the post office. Right. You know, I'm glad we have both. Yeah. But to get rid of the post office completely, I think would be a, a disaster. Right. And to get rid of, um, you know, you should have public hospitals and private hospitals. But to put all the hospitals under the control of Wall Street hedge funds, you, you can predict it's going to be bad, and we can see what's happened in this country. We have we spend more for healthcare than any nation on earth, and we have per capita, and we have we're seventy ninth in health outcomes. So we're behind Nicaragua, behind mm. Mongolia, we're behind Cuba in terms of our health outcomes in this country. That is not good. Yes, no, well said, and that that is a difficult path to navigate between deregulation and then maintaining some regulation. So that makes sense. Let public and private compete. Um, definitely one view on it. I guess Javier Malay is much more anarcho-capitalist about the whole thing. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down costs. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. 
So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. We want you to join us for two days of discussions and debate, which is all happening at the inaugural Dissident Dialogues 2024. This incredible event will take place in Brooklyn on May the 3rd and 4th. You'll be joining leading thinkers such as Richard Dawkins, Stephen Pinker, Ian Hersey Ali, John McWalter, Aisha Canby, Michael Schellenberger, Mary Harrington, Chris Williamson, Winston Marshall, Constantine Kissin, Francis Foster, and more. Hang on a second, since when have you ever been a serious thinker? I love thinking, it's my favorite hobby. Sometimes, of an evening, it's all I do. Think. Moving swiftly on, we want you to join us for a gathering where everyone is part of the conversation. Conservatives, progressives, atheists, theists, left, right, and everything in between. Dissident Dialogues presents a rare opportunity to immerse yourself in a conversation with the most influential thinkers of our time. We'll tackle important topics relating to religion, science, politics, and culture. If you're driven by intellectual honesty, curiosity, and a desire for the truth, Dissident Dialogues is the place for you. It's not just an event, it's the beginning of an intellectual journey. And we want you to come along for the ride. I like rides. Dissident Dialogues is a place for dangerous ideas. Buy your tickets now at dissidentdialogues.org and be part of the conversation. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores, they are difficult to prepare, and even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code Breed love. Uh, on that topic of healthcare, I heard you say this recently, and this blew my mind. You said that there are studies which show that autism rates among men ages 69 and above, I think, are one in 10,000. So one in 10,000 men ages 69 and up, or maybe just ages 69, have autism. Whereas in our children today, that, that ratio is one in 34 kids have autism. That's the CDC data. And they, CDC you know, data. And you said there was a threshold. Old men are, it's, um, they vary. Mm -hmm. um, one in 2,500. Uh, there's a number of studies that say one in 2,500, one in 2,000, or one in 10,000. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can tell you this, and I've been around intellectual disabilities my whole life because I was raised in the middle of Special Olympics. Mm -hmm. Special Olympic, my aunt, Eunice Schreiber, who was also my godmother, found a Special Olympics who was originally called Camp Schreiber. I worked at uh, I worked at Special Olympics from when I was eight years old um, and, and as a hugger, as a coach, and throughout my whole life. And then when I was in high school because this commitment to people with intellectual disabilities is, is part of my family DNA. I spent mm. 200 hours in Los Angeles for the retarded. And I can tell you this, I have never met anybody my age, ever in my whole life, with full-blown autism. Mm. By full-blown autism, I mean non-toilet trained, non-verbal, head-banging, mm. uh, toe-walking, stimming, hand-flapping. Um, I've never met anybody that looks like that ever my age. Well, I, you, know, you don't see people like that at the mall. There are no homes where they would be confined. Mm -hmm. 
They just, they basically don't exist in my generation. But in my kids' generation, one in every 34 kids looks like that, one in every 22 boys. So, um, and something happened. Congress said to EPA, tell us what year the autism epidemic mm. began. And mm -hmm. EPA, EPA is a captive agency, but it's not yeah. captured by, by, it's captured by oil and coal and chemical. Mm -hmm. It's not captured by pharma because it doesn't regulate pharma. So it actually did a real study and came back with real science that said it's 1989. That was the change year. It was a red line. Something happened in 1989. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not only autism. It's all these autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. popped up around then. So, you know, another thing I mention a lot is juvenile diabetes. When I was a kid, uh, a Typical pediatrician would see one case of juvenile diabetes in his entire lifetime. Say he had a 40 year career, right. one case. Hey, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is pre diabetic or diabetic. Right? So, what happened? You know, I, I never knew. I had 11 siblings, Robert. Mm. I had about 70 first cousins. I, I never knew anybody with a food allergy, a peanut allergy. Yeah. Never knew anybody my entire life. Why do five of my seven kids have food allergies? Wow. Why, you know, why do I have kids that are anaphylactic? If they, if they touch a peanut, they'll die. Right. There's kids like that in every classroom. And, it, and something happened in 1989 that triggered all this cascade of chronic disease. Six, we went from 6% when my uncle was president of chronic disease to 60% today. Wow. And, and, you know, it's, it's auto, it's neurological disease, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Rett syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism. I never heard of any of these when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and then autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile diabetes, lupus, Crohn's disease, all these exotic diseases where your, your immune system starts to attack your own body. Mm -hmm. And then the allergic diseases, peanut allergies, food allergies, eczema. I never heard of eczema. I, you know, I bet these kids who work for you know 10 people of eczema. Yeah. I never heard of it. Yeah. Nobody yeah. had it in my high school. Nobody had it in my grade school. It, nobody knew about it. And yet, it's, nobody had ticks. Mm -hmm. I never knew anybody with ticks, and now they're everywhere. Something happened, and it happened in this country and nowhere else in the world. So, you know, we've got more a higher level of chronic disease than any country in the world. We also happen to have a thousand ingredients in our processed foods that are mm. illegal mm. in other countries. Mm. We have a vaccine schedule. And by the way, all of these injuries are listed as side effects on the manufacturer's inserts of the vaccines that we give to our children. But when I was a kid... I got three vaccines and I was compliant, mm. completely compliant. My kids got 72 and that, that began in 1989. Mm. So that was the big change here. And all of those diseases are listed as side effects on the manufacturer's instincts of those vaccines. So that has to be one of the culprits, but it, it's, it's, I don't never say it's all the vaccines. It, there, our kids today are swimming around in a toxic soup, and there's a famous uh, uh, toxicologist who I've used on many lawsuits. His name is Phil Landrigan, and he's actually looked at this issue, and he said something happened in 1989, mm -hmm. and, it, it, and that it, it's ubiquitous. It touched every American demographic from Cubans in Key Biscayne to, to Inuit in Miami, mm -hmm. I mean in Alaska, mm -hmm. And it and you can, there's other things about the, this cascade of diseases that you know that, that are kind of signals. One is that it affect the neurological injuries affect boys at a four to one ratio to girls. Mm. Oh, you need a toxin that does that that has that impact that has that you know um, uh, uh, it has that kind of impact. Mm. Oh, Landrigan looks at what could it possibly be? There's not that many things, right, that became ubiquitous around 1989, the early 90s, and one of them is glyphosate from mm -hmm. Roundup, mm -hmm. which is now in all of our food. Um, another is neonicotinoid pesticides, 
which became ubiquitous at that time, aspartame, which is in our, you know, all swingers. our drinks, yeah. right? Fluorides, um, which is in our, our water, yeah. uh, PFOAs and PFASs, which is a flame retardant that's in all of the furniture now, and yeah. it was put in our child's pajamas around that time in the early 90s. Um, high fructose corn syrup, Okay, clearly is related to the obesity and diabetes mm -hmm. epidemics, uh, uh, almost certainly. Um, atrazine, which is another pesticide, cell phone radiation. Uh, and then uh, uh, you know, in, on the list is also ultrasound. So ultrasound also became ubiquitous. And I, do I think ultrasound is doing anything? I don't think so, but I don't know. Right. Somebody should be looking at all of these because there's a, there's a limited universe, you know. It's mm -hmm. like I I think they, he came up with about thirteen things. Well, it's easy to study. It'd be easy. You could do that overnight with data that we already have. You don't even need to do you know new studies. Mm. You can do it, but uh, the NIH won't let anybody do those studies. Mm. And that's because they don't they they don't want to lift that rock. Because they know underneath it's going to be some big shot. It's going to be Smithfield. It's going to be Monsanto. It's going to be Cargill. It's going to be, you know, the, all the food processing companies, all the big ag, the big, you know, pharmaceutical companies, somebody that they don't want to mess mm. with. And so we're not allowed to know the answer. Oh, so that pollution that you were talking about at the beginning, I mean, this isn't just polluting the environment. The pollution is now in us, right? We've yeah. polluted ourselves effectively. Um. Terrible. Um, that is definitely something we need to deal with if we're going to heal as a country and heal as people. Right? We, yeah, all these things they have to be intertwined. That's a that's a big scary one, and it sort of highlights how complex the world is too. I want to ask you a, I guess, more of a personal slash philosophical question, if I might. You've been very open about your the addiction problems you had in your youth, um, and you talked about on a show that I watched that it created like a dishonesty within you. You said something like if someone asked you where you got your shirt, the first thing you would ask about is, or you would think about is, you know, how do I gain power in this conversation rather than, hmm, where did I get the shirt? Yet over time, you started pain, I think you described it as like the painful telling. Like when you say something that's not true, you would come back to that same person and say, actually what I just said is not true. And the pain of doing that over time enables you to discipline yourself into becoming an honest person. Um, and then there was this something you read by C.S. Lewis, you said, which inspired you to strive to become as honest as the daylight. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but I also have heard you say something to the effect that your campaign is essentially an experiment on telling the truth to the American people, to see what, where that will take you. What can't, and this is the philosophical part. Can you tell me how you personally define Truth is a word we throw around a lot, but I don't think we often zero in on it. And can you describe to me how your relationship with truth has changed throughout your life? Well, first of all, the the, the C.S. Lewis quote that I um, that I came across was no bit. C.S. Lewis was the famous. Mm -hmm. He would never describe himself as a theologian, but he was definitely a Christian philosopher. Thinker, yeah, and philosopher. But yeah. he was a brilliant writer. He wrote yeah. uh, these great science fiction uh, yeah. novels called Paralandra and Out of the Silent Planet. And, and then he wrote kids' books, the Narnia books. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote a series of really brilliant and very, very easy to read, accessible kind of uh, religious. Uh, uh, you're, I, I guess you would call them monographs almost. Your Christianity? Is your one? Christianity yeah. is right. The problem yeah. of pain. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he, uh, and he's a very interesting mind. He deals, you no, know, he's got a chapter, and I think it's in Mere Christianity or The Problem of Pain, mm -hmm. which are very short books, very easy to read um, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, what happens to pets when they die. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's fascinating stuff, but he is. Probably his most influential books are um, the Screw Tape Letters, which mm -hmm. is a which is a, a series of letters from a of a de from a devil, a senior devil, um, to a junior devil who's trying to tempt a human being who has just righted their life. 
somebody who's sort of just gotten sober and made a commitment to turn their life over to, uh, you know, um, a new, like a Christianity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this, and the devil, the young devil is trying to lure the person into, you know, back to their old ways. Mm -hmm. And the senior devil is writing him letters about how to do it. And it's a brilliant, it won a Pulitzer Prize, a short book, and it's very, very fun to read. And then he wrote another book um, that I love uh, called The Great Divorce, and it's about a bus ride from hell to heaven. And, and the way that he portrays hell in that book is a, a place where you can have anything that you want. So mm -hmm. you arrive in hell and you say, I want a nice house. But to you, a nice house is like this house you got here, mm -hmm. right? It's it's really great, really. It has everything you need, but it's kind of simple. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. extravagant. It doesn't have an Olympic size pool. It has <laughs> like a, you know, a, a modest pool, right? Oh, you get that when you go to hell. You you know, you say, I want a house like that. But then you see your neighbor has one that's twice as big with, a, with an Olympic uh -huh. size pool. So you say, I want I want now one bigger than my neighbor. Well, you get it then immediately. But your old house doesn't disappear. It's still there. And the new house is then on the outskirts of the town. The town keeps getting bigger and bigger uh -huh. because People keep demanding new houses and they get farther and farther apart and humanity gets farther and farther and farther apart as they get bigger and bigger stuff. Wow. And there's no real companionship. But once a week there's a there's a bus that leaves from the downtown and it goes to heaven. And when they when the when they get to heaven, they heaven the way they the, the what you do when you get to heaven, I'm telling you this because it's kind of, it, it's uh, it's really an interesting insight into, into C.S. Lewis and the way that he imagined it. But it was very helpful to me at one point. But it's a place where when you, you land there, you land at a, kind of the shore of a, of a great sea. Mm -hmm. And then you start hiking inland. And you're hiking toward these distant mountain ranges. And that's where God is. But it's light years away. But the, every step you take closer to that mountain range, the more love that you feel, the more peace that mm. you feel, the more serenity that you feel. And you walk through fields and forests and all kinds of different terrains, and you will meet other people. And then you'll walk with them maybe for a day, maybe for a few hours, maybe for months, maybe for years. And ultimately, you meet everybody who's ever lived, and you hear their story, and you interact with them. And you know, sometimes you go in large groups, sometimes small, but you're always going toward a different distant mountain range. Mm. Occasionally, you get called back because you know one of the people, or you have a special ability to coax one of the people who's coming up from hell to stay in heaven. Now, when they get to heaven on the bus, mm. they're allowed to stay there forever, but they have to give up the character defect with the resentment or the mm. anger or the addiction that was keeping them in hell. And so you have these people come back who are trying to talk them into it. And it's just this, it's a very, very beautiful story. And, um, and in the end, the bus goes back, half the people on the bus stay and half of them go back. But when the bus leaves, it, it, they have the sensation that they're leaving on a journey to a distant planet, which mm -hmm. is hell. But actually, the way that the people in heaven perceive it, it, the bus just shrinks and shrinks until it becomes tiny, tiny, and it disappears into the interstitial <laughs> grains on the beach. And, you know, so the people in hell have this perception that they live in these grand houses in this great <laughs> place, but everything in reality is is infinitesimally tiny. But anyway, I read an obituary that he wrote, that C.S. Lewis wrote about a friend of his, and he described his friend as honest as the daylight. And I, it just something about that phrase struck mm. me. And at that time, I was not, did not see myself as an honest person. If you're a drug addict, you can't be honest. Sure. And right. I was a drug addict. I was a DA at the same time, and, you know, oh, I, there would have been terrible consequences if I had been honest. And, um, you know, I also, because of the exposure in my life that, you know, anybody who learned anything bad about me could use those mm -hmm. things and put them in the press. So there was an incentive to keep secrets, to not be honest, and particularly because I was an addict. So um, I, I also recognized that when I was getting sober that 
that, that I, there was a direct connection. In fact, in the in the big book of AA, it says the only people who cannot get sober using these steps, using this program, are people who are constitutionally incapable of telling the truth. Mm. Those are the only people. Mm. It says mentally ill people we can deal with. The only people who can't get sober are people who are constitutionally wow. incapable of telling the truth. So they go truth. hand in hand then. Yeah, and wow. so and it, it's clear throughout that book that that in order, they say it again and again. In order to um, get sober, you have to you have to maintain a a life of rigorous honesty. Wow, and that doesn't mean that you have to spill your guts to everybody that you meet. Right, but it means that you can't afford to have any secrets. In other words, there has to be at least one person in your life. Who knows everything about you? Right. You know, who from whom your deepest, darkest, yeah. take it to the grave secrets. Yeah. That there's at least one person who knows that. Huh. Because otherwise your secrets will make you drink again. They'll make you get high again. They'll you know, they'll wow. destroy you. Right. Oh so, um so I, you know, at one point I'm, I made a decision, just an intellectual decision. I'm just, I'm gonna be rigorously honest no matter what the cause. Mm. But I was habitually um, I, dishonest. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know whether I describe myself as a pathological. I wouldn't describe myself mm -hmm. as a pathological liar, but I, but I definitely was a habitual liar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in order to break that habit, I had to, when I caught myself saying something that wasn't true, I had to immediately say to the person, what I just said to you was not true. And mm -hmm. that was humiliating and mm -hmm excruciatingly painful mm -hmm. and it's the pain that gets us to change that's right oh i you know i don't know if i described it in the interview that you listened to but i had a moment in court where i was in a federal district court in front of the senior judge um in white plains and i um i was in the middle of an argument and i and during that argument judge asked me a question and i i said something that was not true and, but it was something that was, it was inconsequential. Mm -hmm. It would not have, there was no way that I could ever get found out. Mm -hmm. You know, it just happened to be not true. And it wasn't that big a deal, but I sat down and I just, uh, I, I, it just started eating me. Mm -hmm. And so the next time I stood up, I said, your honor, I wanted to say that um, what I said in my last statement was not true. And there was just a moment, like a microsecond, in the court with a bailiff and the, you know, the, uh, the woman who was the stenographer, and everybody just sort of looked up for a second. Where it's like, oh, I haven't seen that before from a lawyer. <laughs> and then everybody went back to business as usual, and the moment passed. You know, but for me, it was a critical moment. You know, I'm, I'm sure everybody else forgot it within seconds. But for me, it was critical because you know it's. It was part of me making a commitment to myself that yeah. no matter what the cause was, um, that I I was uh, that this was the most important thing to me. To be honest with other people, wow. and I read that around that time. I read that obituary by C.S. Lewis, and I was like, "Wow, you know, I, I I wish that one day somebody would say that about me." Wow. Um, that's fascinating the the connection between the deception and the addiction i've never thought about it that way that they, they do they have to go hand in hand after you cannot right. be honest yeah. and be a drug addict. right I mean, yeah. unless, unless you're unless you inherited a, like a lot of money yeah. and you don't care about anything <laughs> right and, but even then you know you, you even got, then you're going to you lie about something yeah because it, it's illegal what you're doing right so. right exactly exactly <laughs> That's very interesting to think about. Uh, okay, wow. Over the past nine years, I've been going through a pretty serious struggle with my personal health. It started with a sharp pain and stiffness in my hip after a lifting injury, which I later learned was related to some pretty extensive inflammation in my gut. Then I developed an autoimmune issue, and soon I was having joint pain all over, skin irritations, and all kinds of digestive issues. I visited many doctors trying to figure out what was wrong, but none of them were able to help me fix any of my issues. I eventually started to see an energy healer with whom I had some limited success, 
But it wasn't until I started working with the biohacker Anthony D. Clementi last year that I was finally able to start making real progress on my healing journey. Anthony spent a lot of time with me learning about my specific situation and worked with me to adapt a custom health plan to address my needs. Anthony has served as a personal biohacker for celebrities, billionaires, and professional athletes all over the world. Besides helping people like me overcome health issues, Anthony and his world-class medical team also help guys that just want to optimize their cognitive performance, guys that want to pack on some muscle, and guys that just want to get shredded. Anthony keeps a tight book of business and is selective about the clients he brings on. To apply for Anthony's biohacking services, text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Again, to apply for Anthony's biohacking services, just text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Thanks to my friends at Swan Bitcoin for supporting the show. Swan sponsored the Sailor Series, and I appreciate their support from the very beginning of the What Is Money show, and I'm happy to welcome them back. Swan has grown a lot since then. They've built a full-service Bitcoin-centric financial services company with several different offerings. With the Swan app, you can set up instant and recurring Bitcoin buys. And with this, you can get started at swan.com slash breedlove. Swan also enables clients in the U.S. to hold Bitcoin directly in an IRA account, so you can hold Bitcoin in a tax-advantaged way. Get started at swan.com IRA. If you're looking to buy more than $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, check out Swan Private. You'll get concierge support for buy execution, retirement accounts, inheritance and estate planning, and access to exclusive events, research, and other content. Get started at swan.com slash private. Swan Institutional provides financial services to institutions, including Bitcoin-backed lending, asset management, principal investments, Bitcoin services for financial advisors, and Bitcoin mining operations. For those new to Bitcoin, I recommend checking out Swan's Welcome to Bitcoin course at swan.com slash welcome. So go to swan.com slash breed love today to get started on your bitcoin buying journey are you sick of being robbed by politicians through inflation and endless money printing if so you need to be at bitcoin 2024 in nashville tennessee on july 25th through 27th as the largest bitcoin and fintech conference in the world bitcoin 2024 stands as a beacon of monetary freedom a glimmer of hope amongst a darkening macroeconomic backdrop. Top speakers, companies, and thought leaders from across the industry will convene in Nashville to look ahead to the next year and beyond. I will be there, and Bitcoin conferences like this have become my favorite place to socialize since becoming a Bitcoiner. Ticket prices will increase soon. Get your tickets now and secure your spot at this game-changing event. So go to b.tc slash conference and use discount code BREEDLOVE to sign up for the Bitcoin 2024 conference. Again, that's b.tc slash conference, discount code BREEDLOVE. Um, okay, you, I guess let me ask you this, sort of on, you mentioned court and you mentioned the lawsuits you'd taken against Monsanto and others. Richard Feynman has this quote that I really love. He said, I'd rather have questions without answers than answers that cannot be questioned. And you've described this quote unquote, trust the experts ethos that we've seen recently as not a feature of science, but rather a feature of totalitarianism. Um, and, and I've, I've said it this way. I think it's similar to what you're saying that Science is a systematic method of questioning. When you say don't question the science, you're saying don't question the questioning. Like it's a nonsensical phrase when you decompose it. Uh, it's oxymoronic. Oxymoronic, it, it, exactly. It, science is dynamic. It's always changing. Yes. Every, you know, every, you know, I mean, look at, the, look at Galileo, look at Copernicus. Mm-hmm. They were challenging scientific orthodoxies by using the scientific method. Look at Newton. Exactly. Look at, you know, any scientist in history, you know, Einstein, et cetera, they were always, they moved science from yes. a consensus to, you know, a new, uh, a, a new, paradigm. new paradigm. Yeah. And motiv- uh, motivated by a pursuit, a loving, caring pursuit of the truth, actually, right? Like yeah. Galileo put himself at risk to 
oh, break yeah. new grounds and things like that. So yeah, Galileo, uh, Galileo actually recanted because yeah. he was told, if you don't recant, right. we're going to burn you at the stake. Yeah. So he recanted. He said, yeah, the sun doesn't move. And, yeah. and then as when he famously, when he was leaving the courtroom, he he said to himself, but it was audible to people around him, and yet it moves. Mm -hmm. so, you know, he was like, "Yeah, I'm going to say what you tell me to do, yeah. but you know, it yeah. moves. We can't stop it. Right, it's right. moving." So, what I want to ask is, what is okay? We need people need to have a reverence for truth to pursue it honestly. That again, that's basically what science is, as we've described. Yet now it seems like in this world of money printing that experts can really just be bought right as you were saying in your court case that you well, you brought certain experts monsanto brings certain experts what can we do to instill a reverence for truth among these so-called experts and how do we where does the the role of money printing fit into this because it seems like you can use the money printing then to create whatever experts you need and engage in acts of social engineering so it, I kind of like there's this weird metaphysical connection between honesty and overcoming addiction. There seems to be this problem with money printing. Like it's not true. There's an economic deception involved and it's creating these false realities like false experts, uh, propaganda, et cetera. So I'm um, sorry, that's kind of a complicated question, but what can we do in the face of money printing and social engineering and getting to people getting people to go towards truth rather than be engineered. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, some of those are, uh, uh, those connections seem, uh, they seem true to me, but uh, although a little tendentious, um, you know, um, I mean, the, my, the Fed, what the Fed does is a lie, and mm. it's a fiction that everybody believes. Right. That this money has intrinsic value, and it's the it's the belief in it that actually gives it value. It's right. that consensual belief in it. So just like know, a lie, what, right? What the lie? It, if it's it, believed in, it has value. If not, it, it doesn't. Yeah, it is. It is a lie. But um, you know, there's another. I think another issue about um, just what our you know what our purpose is. You know, and I, I believe that. That God put us here for a purpose, which is in, in to search for existential truths, which mm. is, you know, what is our relationship with our creator ultimately? Mm. But, you know, we do that in a, in, you, know, you know, each of us is given a different set of gifts, a different set of passions, and, um, and in our own, whether you're a writer, whether you're an artist, whether you're a doctor, whether or a scientist or lawyer, all of us, our job ultimately is to search for existential truths. And mm. some of us do that through the adversarial method, like in law. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you take a position that you may not necessarily believe, but it's an extreme position, and you make your argument, make your best argument, then you let the jury, you know, hopefully it's a mm -hmm. system where a jury actually says, which of these is true? So you're looking for existential truth. Science is supposed to be a search for existential truth. It gets corrupted by money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the scientists, and now most of the scientists in the our country and in the world are employed by industry. And they are not, they're looking for ways to, you know, I, I'd say the biggest group of scientists right now in this country is working for the processed food industry. Mm. And there are a lot of them over from big tobacco. Mm -hmm. And tobacco started declining, and they're designing foods that don't that are designed to not fill you up, to leave you hungry. They're designed food to um, to contain ingredients that are addictive, mm -hmm. that drive you to get more and more. Mm -hmm. and there's sugar or salts or a lot of other these you know artificial and synthetic chemicals. They they design them to addict you to really bad stuff. So the whole thing is a lie. Mm -hmm. You're not eating mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. You're not eating. You know you're mm -hmm. eating commodities. Right. Um, you're eating <laughs> chemicals. You're eating chemicals, yeah. and you know, the, and the whole thing is like so. The system get, has been utterly corrupted. Um, and you know, I, I agree with what you said that, that um, trusting the experts. We were all told during COVID, trust the experts, but that's not a thing. Mm -hmm. 
trusting the experts is not a feature of science. It's the opposite of science. It's not a feature of democracy. You know, my father told me when I was a kid that people in authority lie. Mm -hmm. And in a democratic system, your job is to maintain a constant posture of skepticism toward Mm -hmm. figures of authority. Mm -hmm. We're all part of our job of living in a democracy is to question authority constantly. Mm. Is to mm-hmm. is to you know that doesn't mean to be disobedient. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean to be disrespectful, but it means you know not trusting somebody to tell you what reality is, right. and that and then not as asking basic question yourself. Trusting the experts is a feature of religion. It is a feature of totalitarian systems, not of democracy or science. Mm. And you know if we're going to be a science based um, country. Mm-hmm. We have science-based policies, which we pride ourselves on. If we're going to have a democracy, then we need to question everything. And, you know, by questioning things, you, you're, that's part of your search for existential truths. Right. And, you know, those are the truths that you know, are actually true. Mm-hmm. Now that, uh, you know, the, the temperature of, of water when it freezes, that is, mm-hmm. you know, that is truth. The location of, you know, of... North Pole, the location mm-hmm. of you know, of uh, of of Fargo, North Dakota, mm-hmm. these are are discernible, provable truths. What your your father said to you that um, people in positions of authority lie, so we we must maintain a healthy orientation of skepticism towards them and ourselves and others. Right, we should always be sort of as they say in Vegas, trust everyone, but always cut the cards. As we say in Bitcoin, don't trust, verify. And there's all these sayings, yeah. but it's um, to get to that point of social consensus about where the North Pole is or where water freezes yeah. or where it boils. Um, this is obviously a very important feature of, of social organization. Um, okay, you, so we've got a little bit of time left, but I have to ask you about censorship because you are one of the most censored men in the world, as far as I know. Um, this is going back to the COVID saga. I believe you were saying certain things that were not consistent with the narrative at that time. And I heard this on an interview where you were telling it in retrospect. The White House was apparently telling Facebook to censor you. Uh, however, Facebook actually pushed back, <laughs> in Facebook's defense, uh, and said that the things you were saying were not untrue, so that it was not actually misinformation. And then they, they or the White House or some uh, combination of the two then invented a new term, malinformation, which, uh, which is, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Uh, malinformation is information that is true but should be censored anyway because it's inconvenient for the government. And it actually, <laughs> I looked up the etiology of the word and the yeah. word was not actually coined at that moment. Uh-huh. It was... Uh, it, 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 it was used a couple of times. Uh, I forget when the first time it was maybe a decade ago. Um, but it was it was then ubiquitously used after mm. that because they knew they were censoring things that were true. Mm. You know, mm-hmm, somebody mm-hmm. comes, a doctor says, I mean, they were censoring posts when people posted web pages from CDC's website. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. Right, and you could get censored for that. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was something they all agreed was true, and yeah. I, you know, I was very careful because I knew I there was a lot of eyeballs on me. So I had probably the most robust fact checking operation in journalism at that time. I had uh, we have three hundred and fifty PhD scientists and MD physicians on our advisory board, including Luke Montanier, who was the you know, won the Pulitzer Prize for discovering HIV. You know, we had really prominent scientists. Yeah. And they weren't going to tolerate me posting garbage science. So everything I posted was cited and sourced to a government database or to a peer-reviewed publication. And that doesn't mean it's true, but it means that, you know... Uh, uh, you you need to sh- show you, me, yeah. you need to show me something right. contrary. You can find another peer reviewed publication that doesn't agree with that, yeah. but you know, I'm posting it in good faith. Yes, and I, I you know you can't just you just can't declare you can't just get this 
this fact-checking cartel, which is utterly uh -huh. corrupt, uh -huh. you know, that was supposedly fact-checking us, and uh -huh. they look who pays them, and it's Bill Gates and the pharmaceutical right. industry and the State Department. Yeah. And they were just fact-checking anything that didn't agree with government orthodoxies. And right. if you disputed any government orthodoxy, you were a conspiracy theorist. So, you know, the conspiracies that I got, you know, deep platform for, mm -hmm. were, um, I said that the vaccines were not, in, in early 2020, I said the vaccines will not prevent transmission. They were all saying, you got to get vaccines so grandma doesn't get sick. And I said, mm -hmm. they're not going to prevent transmission. Why did I say that? Because I was reading the monkey studies, mm -hmm. which were available publicly, but nobody was reading them. A monkey study, they only tested, I think it was three monkeys, mm. right? I mean, these were just like the most, you know, BS studies that mm. Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca were using. But they gave one of the monkeys the vaccine, or two of the monkeys the vaccine, and then there was a placebo monkey, and then they gave them COVID, and they all got, had the same levels of, of COVID concentrations of the of the virus in their nasal pharynxes. So they said, mm. yeah, the vaccine's not going to prevent transmission. So mm. they knew it back then, but they were lying to everybody. And you, you know, you can go back and look at the Anthony Fauci, Joe Biden, mm. you know, everybody's saying if you take the vaccine, you can't pass it. Well, they knew that was a lie. Right. But I said then it's not going to do that. So I got branded a conspiracy that now everybody admits it doesn't do it. Right. I said it's not going to prevent you from getting sick. Because that's what happened to the monkeys, and and it, that's what happened in the clinical trials, which I was reading. You mm -hmm. know, the people who got it got sick. Later on, they were saying, "Oh, well, it was never trying to prevent sickness." That's not true. It was. They were mm -hmm. telling us who was. They said it just prevent serious illness, which it didn't prevent either. Mm -hmm. So you know, they were just lying about. It. So I said, I, I said, masks are not, you know, I was looking at the studies and we found and published all the studies we could on masks and all virtually all of them said they don't work against respiratory viruses. And that in fact, they're probably worse. So I said, the mask, there's no science. I said, there's no science mm -hmm. for the social distancing, mm -hmm. which a month ago, uh, Anthony Fauci took the oath and said to the Senate, they asked him, where did you get the social six foot social distancing? Mm. And he said, I don't know. It just came out, came from somewhere. We don't know. There was, was there any science? No. Oh, well, I said that at the time and I got banned as being, you know, a conspiracy theorist. But they were saying things they knew were lies. Mm -hmm. They knew they had no basis for. And you remember what it was like then. If you stood less than six foot from somebody, you could get in a fist fight with them. Oh, yeah. the Americans were hating on each other yeah. because they were told to believe something that was a lie, that mm -hmm. was not true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anybody like myself, it wasn't just me, it was you know, famous, world famous scientists like Jay Bakhtavia and, and all of these other ones from the, you know, the um, who signed on to the, uh, uh, that, the declaration, um, I, I forgot what it was called, the Vermont Declaration. Mm -hmm. All of those scientists, I think 56,000 scientists signed on, and they were all, you know. Lost their licenses. They were all marginalized yeah. and yeah, demonized yeah, yeah, and yeah. deplatformed and, and stuff. So it was, it was really a, a strange time. But the problem is now everybody says, oh, well, they're not doing that anymore. Yeah. They are doing it, by yeah, the way. They're now course. doing it. On, yeah. You're not allowed to talk about Ukraine. You're not allowed yeah. to talk about, you know, there's a lot of things you're not allowed, allowed mm -hmm. to talk about. You know, I, I, but um, the problem is they gave themselves the power to do that. Mm -hmm. And they have not revoked their power to do that. So all they need is the next crisis. And that sure. could be climate. Right. It could be you know, some other pandemic. It could be a war. It could be a financial collapse. But now they have the power to lock us all in our house and yeah. to tell us to distance each other and right. to tell us to wear masks and to tell us to, you know, to submit to uh, unwanted medical interventions. Yeah. We lose our job. We lose, and they've established that precedent. And to me, that's very frightening. 
know, in an era of AI mm. and the era of, of all these other surveillance technologies that are being used to harvest our data, but can also be used for social control. Yeah, I think it was, it was a terrible time. And I think the most pernicious thing was it wasn't just telling people to believe the lie, it was coercing them to enact the lie, right? Yeah. Like the, the, the compliance ritual of wearing the mask. But when you get to the table and sit down, you can take it off. Or if you order, you know, just it was all so much nonsense. I know what they were doing on the airplanes was insane. Oh my God, it's crazy. And that whole, yeah, it reminds me of Nietzsche's quote that everything the state has is stolen and everything it says is a lie. And it just felt like we're immersed in that reality for years. Um, and I don't know, we, yeah, we need to do something about that. Um, if I may ask you one last question, um, and this probably goes into the bucket of things that we're not allowed to talk about that much, but what are your views on the Israel-Palestine conflict, and uh, what, if any changes, would you make as president? Yeah, I mean, that's not a short question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, what, I, I'm anti-war. And that doesn't mean I'm against all wars. Mm -hmm. you know, I think all wars are bad, but there are, um, there are wars that are immoral, and those are any war of choice. So I would say every war that we fought in our country over the past 100 years, except for one, World War II, was an immoral war. Mm. World War I was an immoral war. My grandfather protested that war. He lost a lot of his friendships. Um, and... Of World War II, to me, was a moral war. We were attacked. Um, we responded against an implacable enemy that said, we want to, you know, we're, we're going to own the world. It's mm -hmm. going to be our, our thousand-year Reich, and we're going to own the whole world, and we have the power to do it. And, you know, and you know, to me, that was a moral war. I think the war, Israel's war against Gaza, is a moral war. They were attacked. They weren't just attacked on October 7th. They were attacked for 16 years before that. There are 2,000 missiles a year, on average 30,000 missiles that Hamas sent over to Israel. Israel did everything it could to not invade Gaza. Mm. Any other country that was being attacked by missiles and commandos and all of these other assaults, you know, you're, it's an enemy that... Hamas does not want territory. There's nothing that will survive to that will satisfy it in its own charter, except the annihilation of Israel, the extermination of every Jew, and um, and then the establishment of a caliphate. And in fact, in its charter, Hamas says that any negotiation with Israel is a violation of Islamic law, except as a ruse. Mm. And you know they've they've. There have been five ceasefires so far, and Hamas has used every one of those ceasefires to rearm, regroup, rehoist the banner, and then attack Israel again. Oh, the October 7th attack, Israel was, you know, had a tactical defense, which was it created the Iron Dome, which is where our money goes, most of our money. The U.S. dollars that we sent to Israel meant to create the Iron Dome, and the purpose of the Iron Dome is to allow Israel to absorb these attacks from its neighbors without responding. Mm. Oh, every missile that Gaza sends, that Hamas sends onto um, Israel, cost Hamas about $800, and it cost Israel $40,000 to shoot it down. Mm. But Israel bore that expense rather than invade Gaza. By the way, I consider myself extremely pro-Palestinian. I have a group in Israel that is the only group in Israel that is, uh, has Palestinians, Jews, and Jordanians on its board. It's uh, next the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work in, uh, with Palestinians all over Israel. I've, been, I've met with the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank. I have friends in Gaza who I'm supporting today. Um, I'm heartbroken by the injury that's being caused in Gaza. And I don't think Israel should be blamed for that. I think Hamas should be blamed. Hamas mm -hmm. attacked Israel. And, you know, Hamas is a kleptocracy. It is victimizing the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. Palestinians have received more money from the international community than any community in the world history. So 
after, in the, between 1948 and 1952, we had a Marshall Plan. We rebuilt 17 nations in Europe that had been leveled during World War II. And we, we successfully rebuilt Europe. Mm -hmm. We did that with a, a contributions of, an, of, 600 and, of $630 per capita to all the people in those 17 countries. Mm -hmm. So for that amount of money, we rebuilt Europe. We've given, the international community has given to date in the last 20 years, $8,600 for every Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And yet they're poorer than when we started. There's 47% of unemployment in Gaza. Gaza should be one of the richest countries in the world. There's miles of white sand beaches. It has a port right at the confluence of the Suez, the Mediterranean, all the Western trade routes. It has rich, rich soil. It has, it's an oasis with abundant water. Why are they so poor? They're poor because of it, because it has a kleptocracy that steals mm -hmm. all the money. So Ismail Hainea, who is the, uh, the, the top person at Hamas, uh, has a net worth, according to Forbes, of $5 billion. Well, mm -hmm. he just stole that from the Palestinian people. That money could have gone for economic development, for building the ports, right. et cetera. The top three guys at Hamas have a network, a, a collective network of $11 billion. Ahmoud Abbas in the West Bank has a net worth of a billion dollars. His sons are worth four hundred and seventy thousand million dollars apiece. His predecessor Yasser Arafat died a billionaire. Arafat's wife lives in Paris. It's twenty-two million dollars a year stipend from the Palestinian Authority. From these people are, are poverty stricken. Mm. The whole thing is just a, a, a criminal, you know, a, a criminal enterprise. It's victimizing the, the people of, of Palestine and mm. stealing from them and then raising them to hate Jews and annihilate Jews to believe that they have a right to mm. return to Israel, mm. which is, you know, is not a right. Mm. And nobody has a right to return. You know, the, the people, Israel, Israel in 1948, the Palestinians declared war on Israel. They invited seven Arab nations in to destroy Israel and exterminate it. Those 750,000 Palestinians left at that point. Most of them left because the Arab countries told them to leave, mm -hmm. and that is well documented. Mm -hmm. And so that they could go in, wipe out the Jews, and then everybody could come back. At the same time, those Arab countries expelled a million Jews of the eight who had been there for 2,500 years, who had done nothing. Mm. Israel accepted all of them. Israel accepted three million Jews from Europe. Mm. Oh, it has taken its share of refugees now. And forty-eight, there were after after World War II, there were one hundred and twenty-two nations created, including all the surrounding nations: Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, mm. Saudi Arabia. All of these were new nations that were created after the war by the Allies drawing lines on a map, India and Pakistan. In each one of them, there were huge amounts of hundreds of millions of refugees who were expelled from one country to another. And the, the you know, the, the UN and the League of Nations uh, program was that we're going to try to create new nations with ethnic homogeneity to, to decrease the level of future wars. Mm. So there were 8 million Arab or Muslims moved out of India, just taken away from their homes and moved to Pakistan. Seven million um, Hindus who were taken from Pakistan and moved to India. Oh. They don't have a right to return. There were 14 million Germans moved out of Czechoslovakia and Czechoslovakia and, this, and the, the Czech Republic and Slovakia were created as new nations. Mm -hmm. And th those Germans were forced back into Germany. All of them were resettled, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of millions. The only refugee group in the world that, that has the, the group that was expelled are refugees and then their children are also classified as refugees is Palestinians. Mm. Why is that? Why are every Palestinian in the world is now classified as a refugee? Mm. There were 300,000 Palestinians who moved to Kuwait. With good jobs in Kuwait, moved their family, their home, resettled there. Why are they still classified as refugees? I have a friend, Adnan Majali, who's a billionaire. 
who lives in in um, in Los Angeles. He is classified as a Palestinian refugee. Mm. He is a U.S. citizenship. Mm. So you know the whole thing, and it, and because there's a UN, a special UN agency called UNRWA that feeds on this conflict and feeds it. And one of the things that we most need to do to settle this conflict is to dismantle UNRWA and to give those responsibilities to the Palestinian Authority or to UNICEF or some other agency. Because that is an agency that is intent on not having the Palestinians build a country for the future Mm -hmm. and instead having them saying, okay, we all have a right to return to Israel, which is not something that Israel could ever accept. Mm -hmm. That, you know, is the real, that ultimately is the issue that we have to solve. Well, Bobby, thank you for your time. I know you've got your hands full with all of this. Um, uh, Your family has been a big inspiration to me personally. So I really appreciate everything that you represent, who you are, and what you're trying to do for this country. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was fun talking to you, Robert. Likewise.